Someone call the Gainesville Fire Department because Steve Spurrier has roasted Billy Napier. Welcome into SEC Football Unfiltered, our podcast from the USA Today Network. I'm Blake Topmeyer, back alongside John Adams. John, we're glad to have you back this week. Uh, we'll talk about how long Billy Napier might be at Florida in a moment. But first, welcome back in. We had Nick Kelly from the Tuscaloosa News last week bringing us up to speed on how things are going with Kalen DeBoer. Did you get a nice uh, day of rest and recovery? You working on your, your third novel or what's up? Uh, no, I was actually under the weather. Isn't that what they say? And yes. uh, couldn't answer the bell. It was disappointing. I usually play through discomfort, but I was concerned about a coughing binge in the middle of the podcast. That's just not a, not a good crowd draw. Well, the Gators like to say that in all kinds of weather, they stick together. But uh, lately, it doesn't seem like they're sticking together in uh, Gainesville. Uh, your friend, Gene Fournette, someone who uh, you know well from your time in uh, Jacksonville, right, John? The columnist there at the Florida yes. Times Union. Uh, he had a column weighing in on the situation with Florida football and Billy Napier, in which he spoke to a handful of luminaries around the Florida program, and uh, Steve Spurrier, a man who's never shy about giving his opinion, gave uh, maybe the most eye-opening one as it pertained to Florida's program, the future of it under Billy Napier. Here's a sampling of what Steve Spurrier told Gene Fernet of the Florida Times Union. Spurrier said, quote, there's a feeling around the Gators of what the heck are we doing? There's a lot of questions, and I don't have the answers to about the organization. Just because you hire the most people doesn't mean you're going to win. All these extra people, I question how much that really helps. End quote. Spurrier there talking about alluding to the size of Billy Napier's staff and all the analysts he has running around. And then Spurrier continues, quote, Billy is a good guy who works his tail off. I like Billy, good family man, but we do wish the organization was a little bit more tidy. <laughs> As far as things that a, a program ambassador can say about the current football coach, um, that's about as damning as it gets, I think. I, I mean, Spurrier did everything but say, sorry, Billy, you're a fired coach walking. And uh, I agree. I think Billy's probably a great fa family man working his tail off, but I, I agree with the HBC. Uh, I have a hard time figuring out what the heck is going on right now, Florida. Well, I thought I was – I liked uh, Stacey's – using the word tidy, it gave me the image of uh, somebody taking a broom and just sweeping Billy out the door. Um, it's, uh, But I'm glad he chipped in with he's a good family man. He likes him and he's working hard. I mean, yeah. yeah, and then we had a follow-up story from the Gainesville Sun, uh, another member of our USA Today empire, John, that said uh, – the, uh, the NIL collective there in Gainesville, Florida, they're going to start trying some new things. Mm. <laughs> you want to know you're behind the eight ball. Have a, a, a former coach of Spurrier's prominence uh, question the direction of the program and then have the head of your, your NIL collective say, you know what, we think we might, might need to start trying some new things. Um, sounds like that, a five-alarm fire to me. And, and yeah, it does. Hey, and, and we remember when Billy Napier was hired and, and – uh, you did a column on him and, and the organization, uh, he was, he was depicted as a man of great detail, nothing left to chance, sort of Nick Saban-esque. He was, uh, and then he hired this army of support staff that just, and so when I was reading that quote from Spurrier, kind of like, man, why do they need all those people? What, what's going you know, I, I imagine a, an office like two people sharing a cubicle and people stumbling around, bumping into each other. Uh, too many cooks in the kitchen kind of scenario. Uh, so what was perceived as a strength upon Billy Napier's hiring, based on what Steve Spurrier said, and we know what kind of weight his words carry, based on that, we think of uh, mm, that wasn't really a good thing after all. Not enough think, room for all those guys. Yeah, on the path to a fired coach, to there, there it usually comes in stages. Like the the first group of people that you lose are are the fickle fans, right? These are the guys, and I like this group. I mean, of, of all the groups, this this might be my favorite. 
They're the ones that at the first sign of trouble, they're heading to their favorite message board and their post normally starts with fire everybody. And then yes. it proceeds to be about, um, you know, a 4,000 word uh, edict on why everybody and their brother should be thrown out with, with the bathwater, no severance, maybe thrown in jail, the whole Perhaps, bit. Perhaps right? uh, tortured first before yes. being dismissed. Uh -huh. No buyout, yes. nothing. No. Uh, so the first to go are the fickle fans. I think the fickle fans, uh, they've been pecking away at their keyboards uh, in Florida for a long time now. They've, they've been off the Billy bandwagon for a while. Then the next one group to go are, are sort of your prominent figures kind of adjacent to the program, some prominent alum, former players, some alumni, someone like in Steve Spurrier's position that are associated with the program. Now they're willing to speak out and say, and they don't do it as prominently. They, they, they don't say fire everybody. But they'll say, well, eh, I really wonder about the direction of things here. And then your next group is the diehards, the ones that just, they pledged allegiance to the the coach, thick and thin, seems like a good man, that good family man. Well, but it comes to a certain stage where you lose the diehards. And I think that Florida's getting, and Billy Napier's probably getting awfully close to losing the diehards. And once you lose the diehards, then it's curtains. Because then, finally, the last group of people decide, this guy can't do it. And that's the administration. And and that's it. And I, and I think... You know, we are we're rounding second base here. He's already lost the second group. He's speeding in toward third uh, of the third group, and it won't be long to get from from third to home. I don't see third base in this scenario. I'm aboard the Titanic. I see an iceberg and people deciding the pretty much consensus opinion is this won't go well. Uh, we need to find those lifeboards, lifeboats and get out of here. But it's um, looking back, um, I didn't think this was a great hire at the outset. I, I'm, I didn't know. I mean, you can't be sure because he did well at Louisiana, uh, but it's a completely different environment, completely different challenge. And uh, admittedly, I wondered about all the peripheral staff. This supposed attention to detail uh butch jones at tennessee uh he had basically had someone mentoring his players on sleep and the team often sleepwalked through games uh so that didn't go well. but sometimes these guys it's almost uh yeah i can't i don't imagine steve spurrier ever saying any I don't think anybody said when Steve Spurrier was hired, well, he's great on details. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't, uh, maybe he was, maybe, I think they said that about Nick Saban uh, being big on details. And so maybe that's sort of a general comp compliment when you don't know exactly, you're not sure of somebody, you just say, well, he's great on details. And if he's great on details, we don't really know the details. So that kind of covers it. Yeah, and, and I think I would add on to that, John, that one of the things about Napier that seemed like a real asset when Florida hired him was his recruiting chops. You know, you always try to hire the 180 of the guy who came before you. And the knock on Dan Mullen after he was fired was he wasn't all that interested in recruiting. Now, I think that narrative um, got blown up a little bit. I think there's some truth in it. I don't think Dan Mullen's the best recruiter out there. I also don't think he's the worst. Um, but that was sort of the narrative when when Mullen was fired. And so you you hire someone who's got a reputation for being a recruiter. And Billy Napier did have that reputation. And I think that was a fair reputation when he came to Florida. Um, but a couple things happened. One, he started losing too many games too quickly. And I think it's a real uphill climb. Uh, you can be a great recruiter, but when your teams are going six and seven, I think it's really a hard sell to recruits. And, you know, at one time last year, he had a recruiting class that was ranked, I think, as high as like number two or number three in the nation. Mm -hmm. Well, they started bailing out towards signing day and Florida wound up with a class ranked number 14th in the 24-7 composite. Number 14, that's about where Mullen was ranking. And Billy Napier is not the coach, X's and O's, that Dan Mullen was. So if you're not out recruiting Mullen, 
um, than what you sell. But I think something else changed along the way. Like Billy Napier, as I said, I think he earned his reputation for being a good recruiter. But after he was hired, or right around the time of his hire, the game changed, right? Recruiting is so much different now than it was even three or four years ago with the dawn of NIL, with transfer free agency. Um, just because you were a good recruiter in 2019, 2020, uh, what have you, doesn't mean you're necessarily uh, the right personality, the right fit for the NIL and transfer era. And I think one of Billy Napier's missteps at Florida has not been hitting the transfer portal harder than he has. He's added some transfers. Um, I think he overperformed with with getting Graham Mertz last year, the quarterback out of the portal. But by and large, we've seen some other guys like a Brian Kelly, like Lane Kiffin, uh, have more success in the portal, I think, be more active in the portal than what Billy Napier was willing to be. And I think that was a mistake because I think he needed uh, more depth of talent than what he inherited when he stepped in there. Yeah, I agree with that, Blake. And looking back, um, I just wonder how things have gone. And it was hard to defend Dan Mullen in his last season. Lord knows I tried, but I just couldn't quite pull it off because I think he is a really good coach. And I thought he recruited well for Mississippi State. He is quirky, and that quirkiness really got magnified when things went badly. However, let's just say hypothetically he had survived that one bas- bad season and come back. I think Florida would have won more games the next year than it won with Billy Napier. They, they went six and seven because I think Mullen can win games on game day. And de- – uh, Billy Napier hasn't shown that he can do this. And admittedly, it's a challenge uh, when you look at the talent level. But you're right. When you take over a program right now, you can't think of particularly one with Florida's recent history where they've had some great highs, also some lows, but some great hires. And the new coach won't be – he won't be compared to the guys that didn't cut it. He will be compared to Steve Spurrier and Urban Meyer. Great coaches, guaranteed winners, and not only winning, but winning with flair. Billy Napier's program kind of looks boring. Billy Napier doesn't have a lot of flair about him. Florida remembers, Florida fans remember the best of times, and they associate them with those kind of personalities, and, and Billy doesn't have that. So, you, you really hit on it, I think, though. When you're going into a new situation, you as a coach now in rebuilding, you've got to think of long-term but also think of short-term. you got to think about where you are and what the expectations are, and you need immediate help. You need those transfers. You've got to – and Billy Napier was saying, say, th- saying things that seemed outdated. He was talking about laying a foundation. Fans cringe when they hear that. They don't want to hear laying a foundation. They want to say, here's how we're going to win right now. Yeah, you want to move into turnkey construction. The foundation's been been laid. Uh, you're walking in. You got a nice island kitchen, granite countertops, and, and, and the whole bit, right? And, and you know, anymore, I think it's important for a coach to be able to galvanize their boosters, be able to galvanize their collective. And I don't know if it all should fall on Billy Napier's shoulder, but, um, you know, it's, it's not been any secret around the SEC that Florida in many ways uh, was sort of behind the game a little bit, I think, in this NIL stuff. Does that all fall on Napier? Probably not. But again, uh, I think you got to have the coach with the right personality to sort of bring everybody together in the NIL space. Um, and at least from the outside looking in, I don't, I don't think Billy Napier uh, has been able to do that. And and so again, I think he was a good recruiter under the old model, uh, but I think it's been shown here the last few years that uh, even though that was one of his best assets, his recruiting chops, I don't know how much of an advantage that is, if at all, in this new model. What I'm wondering, John, is if this job opens this year, as you and I believe, and from the sounds of it, Steve Spurrier believes uh, that it could well open this year, I'm wondering how, I guess, desirable you see the Florida job right now. Let's just take it within the SEC. Um, You know, I think we would start the conversation with some order of Georgia, Texas, Alabama, LSU, 
I mean, to me, correct me, you, you can speak up uh, if you think I'm out of line there, but I, I think let's put those four aside. I think I would rather be at one of those four than Florida. Is that fair to say? No question. Okay. So once we put those four aside, Georgia, Alabama, Texas, LSU, where do you see Florida kind of falling in line in terms of desirability after those those four that I mentioned? I didn't mention Oklahoma. I didn't mention Tennessee. Texas A&M and Auburn, I guess, would be kind of the four that maybe I see Florida going up against in that, that next tier. See, I would put Florida behind Oklahoma and Tennessee. I'm not sold on what Brent Venables will do at Oklahoma, but I know Oklahoma's football history. And I know if he doesn't win big very quickly, and winning big isn't going 10 and 2 at Oklahoma. And I think they will make a change and they will pay big money. And I think Oklahoma has money to spend on NIL. I just said we talk about Texas money. Well, I think of Oklahoma as Texas North. I, hmm. I just think there's money to go around there. Uh, and I think Tennessee has really good leadership now. It was very well organized going into the NIL era, was willing to spend money, and there was that desperation factor of, from fans, we haven't won anything lately. Maybe this is our chance. We're willing to open the pocketbooks and spend for it. And I think that's what you see happening. So Tennessee is on very solid ground, more solid ground than it's been on in many years. So I think Florida's behind those programs uh, right now, and we'll see. But I don't. I think if Brent Venables doesn't do well this year, uh, Oklahoma won't uh, won't keep him. Uh, that's its history. Now you talk about you talk about Auburn. Um, Hugh Freeze, I think, is a pretty good coach. I think Auburn, Auburn people, I think they're willing to spend money too. And so in terms of how good is a Florida job, two other things, forget the SEC, two other things concern me about the Florida job right now. In-state competition outside the SEC. We've seen what Florida State has been able to do with Mike Norvell. So now we have Florida State on the rise at a high level, a playoff caliber program. And it wasn't that way for quite a while. Then we also see Miami, John Ruiz, the mega booster spending all this money. It hasn't, it hasn't climbed to Florida state's heights, but there is promise there because of the money in the NIL. It's attracting a better caliber of player than it did before the NIL. And I think that, that will cause problems for Florida because it's going to have to play Florida state every year. And then next year it's playing Miami too. Uh, but I think Florida needs uh, really what it comes down to is really strong leadership at the university level. And that encompasses NIL too. I think Florida needs all that right now. It's not just hiring a coach you got to have everything else in place, too. And to your point about the in-state competition, John, uh, recruiting rankings are only one, you know, tell of the tape, I guess. It, it, they don't necessarily uh, lead to greatness, but both Miami and Florida State signed higher-ranked recruiting classes this past year than, than what Florida did. So kind of goes to your point about in-state recruiting competition. Um, so you're saying you would put Florida right around the seven seven-ish range jobs, I guess, yes. in the SEC, um, you know, maybe in the conversation with like an Auburn um, and, and Texas A&M was another one I mentioned kind of in that range. I'm wondering then, John, if Oklahoma and Florida both open this year, I'm not as far down the road as you are on, on Venables being let go uh, sooner than later, although... Well <laughs> I'm not firing him today. I, okay. I'm just saying, I'm just putting that in within context of uh, Oklahoma's history with coaches. It's not one to throw good money after bad. If this isn't working, let's move on. Well, let's play that out a little bit. Okay. And let's just say that, that Florida and Oklahoma both opened. I've liked for a couple of years now, um, I've thought Lane Kiffin would be a very good fit at Florida. 
Uh, you mentioned earlier, Florida fans don't just want to win. They want to be entertained. Uh, they won and they were entertained along the way with Steve Spurrier and with Urban Meyer. And Lane Kiffin, I mean, he would he would be entertaining. He'd give you offense. Um, he'd give you instant credibility. Uh, obviously, he's got the whole circus going on on his social media presence. But, I mean, there's a little bit of Spurrier in that, right? I think Spurrier was a little bit more of a quipster at the mic. Um, but Kiffin can do a little bit of that, and he takes care of the rest on on social media. He's entertaining. His teams are entertaining. Again, I've, I've said it for a couple years now. If Lane Kiffin were to leave Ole Miss, I never thought Auburn would have been a good fit. I never thought that, um, you know, he and Alabama were, were going to make that happen. That, that just seemed like a non-starter for me for Lane to be the one that comes after Nick Saban. I thought Florida could make sense, but you've introduced Oklahoma into the conversation. So if it were to come to that, which job would be more appealing if you were Lane Kiffin? Not just which job in a vacuum do you think is better, but for Lane, if he had his choice, does he go OU? Does he go Florida? Or does he just stay right where he is and uh, keep getting those transfers and winning 10 games at Ole Miss? Well, I think Lane Kiffin would be would favor Florida over Oklahoma. It just kind of fits his personality right better. And, and you're right. He's, we talk about personality for the job. I mean, I think uh, Lane Kiffin's dog, Juice, seems more charismatic than Billy Napier. And even though Billy's a great family man and a good guy and is working his tail off, Lane Kiffin comes with more panache. He's got more style. Some people don't like that style. And it might not appeal to a lot of people. It would be welcomed with open arms at Florida. And however, I really wonder looking at the expanded playoff field and looking what, looking at what Lane has already done, I think you can make a strong case for him staying right where he is. And, and I don't know if he would see it that way. I think he can win a championship at Ole Miss. Wow. Mm. I mean, I think this team next year is a championship contender. And because for some, I don't know if it's a lot of times it matters at the school, but sometimes the coach can matter more. And I think wherever Lane Kiffin goes, he will attract a certain kind of player. Then if you have the NIL money to back that up, and I think Lane Kiffin with what he's doing at Ole Miss, I don't know. You wouldn't think Ole Miss would have the financial resources of an Alabama or Georgia, but how in the world is it getting all these uh, transfers? I mean, how does it get a couple of old linemen from Washington, a uh, linebacker from Arkansas, uh, a defensive lineman from uh, Texas a and M? I mean, he, you know he didn't come cheap, so Ole Miss is, is doing it. Uh, if I were Lane Kiffin, I would be reluctant to leave there. Yeah, I think – he would have no bad options if he's got the choice to jump, you know, at some point to either Florida or Oklahoma or stay right where he is. He's got no bad options. A couple of years ago when, um, you know, he and Auburn were in flirtations, I wasn't so sure that was a good option for Lane Kiffin. Not that I think Auburn's a bad job. I just, I, I, I really struggled to see those two parties, you know, knowing what we know about Auburn and knowing what we know about Lane, um, Auburn just seemed like they needed someone to go out and shake the hands and kiss the babies and, and do all that type of thing. And that's not Lane. He doesn't have to do that at Ole Miss. Uh, that is more Hugh Freeze. Uh, which brings me to my next question. John, I want to leave Billy Napier behind here uh, for the moment, as Steve Spurrier has apparently left poor Billy behind, and and get into a little bit more of, of Hugh Freeze and Auburn. I wrote a column about this this week. Uh, at the start of spring practice, Hugh Freeze was uh, asked to respond to Nick Saban's retirement and sort of the power vacuum that that creates with Spurrier or excuse me with Saban out of the sport and I thought Hugh raised a fair question as he's kind of wondering aloud he, he said you know this this creates a, an opportunity and he said quote why not Auburn and I think that's fair for him to ask Auburn has reached up and and had some great seasons won a national championship um, you know, in, in the 2010 season, got close with Gus Malzahn. And the two biggest knocks on Auburn, from where I sit, were one, 
they were living in Nick Saban's shadow and, and also in Alabama's shadow, but the shadow was even bigger when Nick Saban was there. Well, now he's, he's gone now. Still a little bit in Alabama's shadow, but you don't have the, the Saban factor extending that. And then two, those meddlesome boosters that uh, you know Auburn became well known for over the years, uh, that used to be an anchor. I'm now wondering, though, if, the, if that can be rebranded as an asset. Um, you know, re- meddlesome boosters can become ravenous supporters in the, in the NIL era, right? Um, so I don't, my biggest pushback to the question of why not Auburn, I guess, would be because I just like LSU and Texas better. I think they have a head start with Brian Kelly and Steve Sarkeesian. Um, they've got their recruiting machines rolling pretty well at both those places. NIL seems to be in pretty good shape at both those places. Um, so it's less of a, a specific knock on Auburn in this moment and more. Uh, I, I think LSU and Texas are a lap ahead in this race uh, to fill the power vacuum in so much as there is one within the SEC. Yeah, that's that's fair. But I, I do think what's interesting to me about Auburn and its history is when it's been really good, it's cashed in. It, it's it won a national championship in 2010, in 2004 under Tommy Tuberville went to went unbeaten, and it's a shame it didn't get to play for the national championship. Uh, and then in 2013, uh, it came tantalizingly close to winning a national championship before losing to Florida State. So there is potential there. Think about it. Auburn accomplished the 2010 and 2013 seasons in the middle, really at the peak of the Alabama dynasty. Mm -hmm. I I mean, if you can do that, that tells me you can, you can slug your way to the top. And also you bring up a good point about the alums. I kind of see Auburn fans, maybe a little like Tennessee fans. Uh, They didn't go down like Tennessee did. They did have some highs that Tennessee didn't have in its bad years, but that the fans want to win so bad. They just want to win so bad. And desperation is a great motivator. Desperation creates financial opportunities. Well, I'd like to add on to this house, but you know what? I think I'd rather have that linebacker. (laughs) And so I'm going to give him a job and he can, maybe he can build that uh, add on to the house. But, but I think Auburn has that going for it. And I think we talk about fits. I think Hugh Freeze is a good coach in general, but I think he's a better coach at Auburn. I think he fits in really well there with what Auburn wants. So I think there is a great opportunity. Why not Auburn? Hugh Freeze might be right. Yeah, and and something you you said kind of struck me, John, that Auburn, you know, attained some great seasons while the Alabama dynasty was was rolling. Uh, however, you know, in the last few years, I really felt like Auburn was pinned in on both sides because you had rival Alabama still doing its thing with Saban, maybe not to the, the degree that it was at the peak, but still pretty darn darn good and second fiddle, maybe only to Georgia. But that was the other problem. You were pinned in on the other side by your other rival, Georgia. And so I think it's it's one thing to go up against one rival, but it's another to be pinned in kind of in all directions and to be in the shadow of of all. And so, you know, Georgia's going nowhere with with Kirby smart. As we talk about this power vacuum, that's more from the sense of, well, who fills Alabama's place? Georgia's not going anywhere, but we've seen Auburn already win a national championship when one of its rivals was humming. Again, I think it would have been a much different situation continuing to be pinned in by Kirby smart and Nick Saban. Now Kirby's not going anywhere, but at least you got saving out of the picture. And I do, I do think that, um, you know, changes the outlook a little bit for Auburn. I agree. And also I think Auburn can capitalize somewhat on Florida's problems. Uh, it, it's always had a presence there. It recruits the panhandle, uh, you know, and even, you know, the, the Mississippi Gulf coast, uh, Auburn is pretty strategically located where there are a lot of, a lot of good football players are recruiting. Another thing, though, in the NIL era, I don't know if geography matters as much as it once did. I mean, you write the check and you sign it. It really doesn't matter what bank that check's attached to. 
if you can cash it, do you really care where you're going? If that's the best offer, I think that's what recruiting has come, become. And, uh, I mean, or some of these quarterback recruits might make enough money to move their family, uh, to their school. So it, it's just a different game, but I wouldn't, uh, I really wouldn't count Auburn out of it. I, I, Auburn's problem last year and maybe this year too, it doesn't have an elite quarterback. I, I agree. And in the short term, the answer to the question of why not Auburn uh, is for me real simple because you don't have a an upper tier quarterback. You know, it, we, we can talk about all these other big things long term uh, about whether Auburn could be a, a national player or not. But at least as I see it in the short term, and I think these power vacuums, they don't last forever, right? You better move quickly. Someone's going to fill the void. And, oh, by the way, we haven't mentioned, maybe Alabama doesn't go anywhere, right? We, we've already talked about how, you know, I really like the hire of Kalen DeBoer. I think, you know, you you also like it to a certain degree as well. We both expect them, I think, to take a little bit of a step back this year. But who says Alabama is going to fall off the map, right? And so if you're going to, if you're going to act, I think you have to act quickly to fill this void, Um and I do wonder about their quarterback situation with Peyton Thorne. You know, why hasn't, for, for as good as Hugh Freeze has been over the years with quarterbacks, why in a year and a half now has he not been able to attract a better transfer than Peyton Thorne, who's, you know, he's kind of that, like, veteran journeyman who, if you got to roll him out there in a pinch, that's okay, but you're not going to win conference titles with Peyton Thorne, who I'm sure is a great family man himself. <laughs> no, he will uh, work his tail off. He will uh, he'll make a long run every now and then. He'll complete a pass between a couple of defenders occasionally. But play after play, game after game, he doesn't give you what some of these guys are doing. And we're talking now about a league that is stacked, absolutely stacked with quarterbacks, upper-level quarterbacks. And Auburn isn't at that level, as you know. Quarterbacks seem to mean more now than any than they ever have dual threat quarterbacks, particularly. So you would think Hugh Freeze could recruit that. He's he's done it before. Uh, you would think he could do it again. But when you go back and you look at Ole Miss, when he won there, he won with Bo Wallace, who was not considered an elite quarterback. He fit Hugh's system well, but he wasn't. It wasn't at the level of the competition has right now in the SEC. So that will be interesting. And that's a good question you raise. You got to be able to do that. But isn't a lot of that, Blake, don't you think it's, uh, it's again, it's the size of the check. Mm -hmm. If you want to get, if you want to get a top quarterback, uh, Florida attracted one in DJ Lagway. Uh, I guess he'll still end up there, but he's, uh, you know, obviously Florida was willing to spend the money there. You have to be able to do that. I don't see why Auburn couldn't do that. Do you buy in to the supposed quarterback competition at Alabama, John? I, I think, you know, the boots on the ground beat writers there want us to believe, and that's part of the job, right? Spring practice, uh, <laughs> you're writing about competition battles, and let's face it, sometimes I think you're manufacturing competition battles and the coach plays into that the coach wants everyone to believe that it's it's open season on all the starting jobs um i'm not sure i fully buy into it though with alabama i mean i, I think as far as competitions go in the sec alabama's got one of the more interesting ones just because there really aren't a lot of great quarterback competitions around the conference this year i mean i think we could run down the list and for about 13 of the 16 schools we could pretty easily identify the, the starting quarterback without much trouble. And so I guess as compared to others in the SEC, Alabama has a little more intrigue. Jalen Milrow back as the incumbent starter. Ty Simpson and Dylan Lonergan, who were backups last year, they're back. Plus Austin Mack, who is a backup at Washington, followed Kalen DeBoer to Alabama. So it's four, sort of a four-man competition. Milrow plus two backups back from last year in the Washington transfer. But I just have a hard time seeing someone other than Milrow winning this job. I mean, he almost single-handedly led Alabama's offense past Michigan in the Rose Bowl last year. And with someone with his depth of talent, when you pair him with a guy who's been as good with quarterbacks as Kalen DeBoer has been, I know it might take a little bit of an evolution of DeBoer's system, 
And a lot of coaches aren't as willing as they say to fit the system to the quarterback. But still, this is a guy that's had a good track record with talented quarterbacks, made quarterbacks better. I struggle to think that Kalen DeBoer can't make Jalen Milrow better and that Milrow's not going to be the starting quarterback. What do you think? Do you think there's there's some real competition there? I agree with you. Coaches love to encourage the competition angle and in beat writers going into spring practice, you're looking for storylines and, and people want to read about quarterbacks, good, bad, or mediocre. They want to read about quarter. They want to think. So that's an optimistic headline quarterback competition at Alabama. Ooh, you had a Heisman trophy candidate, a quarterback, and you've got somebody good enough to compete with him. Um, uh, no, you, I, I saw a video of Jalen Milrow throwing on social media and, and the fans were chiming in on it. Like it looked like he tightened up his delivery. Mm. And so they're, they're, uh, they're all excited about that. Uh, I don't get that excited when someone is not throwing against competition, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, that is that is key. We see all these guys throwing bullets at the NFL Combine. It's like yeah, but there's there's no defenders on the field. <laughs> there's no, no 330 you, pounder in your face. No, it's a little bit different. Uh, I don't know how good some of the great quarterbacks in the SEC history were, but I think most of them look quite different on game day than they did in practice. Guys like Tim Tebow and Cam Newton and maybe Johnny Manziel or a few other guys, but. I do think you're right. If you're a really good offensive coach, you can shape your offense to the quarterback. Now, the idea that Alabama has got a quarterback better than Jalen Milrow, that's pretty big news. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it I, might I mean, be uh, fake news, as uh, well, a former president might say. Maybe a future Yeah, president. and I, I think uh, – there's a tendency to, when evaluating quarterback, you, you look at what he can't do. And there were times when Jalen Milrow wasn't great, but there were also times where he made that game turning play by improvising. He's an unusual quarterback, but Florida won two national championships thanks to an unusual quarterback in, in Tim Tebow. I mean, you don't, quarterbacks don't normally run over linebackers, that's not their stick. But Milrow is different. You got to find a way to get enhance that talent. I think Kalen DeBoer's bigger problem is not at quarterback. It's the complementary cast, running backs and receivers. He needs somebody elite in those spots, and I don't know that he has it. Yeah, I mean, talking about a guy in Jalen Milrow who has a victory against Georgia in Atlanta just a few months ago, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and, and these other guys that I mentioned, the two backups from last year, Austin Mack, uh, they don't run 40-yard dashes as if they're Usain Bolt, right? I mean, the, the, the X factor that Jalen Milrow brings, that he can turn uh, a quarterback keeper into an 80-yard sprint into the end zone, you find a way to make the offense work for a guy like that. And toward the end of the, the year last year, he was playing pretty well. And as you said, uh, we knew he wasn't going to win the Heisman, but he ended up on some some Heisman ballots based on the way he was peaking down the stretch. I have a hard time seeing uh, him not being being the guy, being QB1 in Tuscaloosa this year. And I'll put it this way. Um, if Kalen DeBoer can't figure it out with Jalen Milrow, then I think Alabama's got problems, not with Jalen Milrow, but with Kalen DeBoer. But I, I think he is going to get it figured out. I think this is sort of a manufactured controversy. Speaking of controversies, John, I want to close with this. Been a lot a lot of, a lot of talk in the last uh, week or so about the future of the college football playoff. New headline every day on this as a uh, few conference commissioners seem to be playing this out uh, through the media or uh, conference or excuse me, uh, university presidents one or the other uh, are getting getting their word out. The latest model we heard last week reported by Yahoo Sports and ESPN was the 14 team model. And we've talked about 14 before, John, as a potential, but this one came with a twist. It is the 3 plus 3 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 3 AL playoff format. That is three auto bids for the SEC and the Big Ten, two auto bids for the Big 12 and the ACC, 
one auto bid for the group of five and three at larges just sort of rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Well, I don't think the SEC wants to leave anything to chance. I, I think the SEC and Big Ten would obviously have the most qualifiers, but if you just stipulate, and this is causing a huge amount of backlash, but one of the problems I have with the uh, with the expanded field, and we were talking about this off air, was if you a uh, hypothetical situation, Alabama and uh, Georgia play during the regular season. Georgia wins. Uh, they they're the top two teams in at the end of the season, on top of the SEC standing. So they meet again in the SEC championship game. Once again, Georgia prevails. Then they both go into the playoff. Georgia's 12 and 0, Alabama's 10 and 2. Lo and behold, Alabama beats Georgia in the national championship game. Now, if I were voting in that top 25 poll, the final one, it would be an easy pick. Georgia beat Alabama two out of three games, has a better record. Georgia should be number one, but they've already celebrated a championship at Alabama. That kind of bothers me. I think it takes away something from the regular season. If you're going to do that, I wish you'd do away with the SEC championship, the conference championship games. I, I just, just don't. Okay, beating a team twice, but but not playing a team, having to beat a team three times to win a championship to me seems a bit much. Yeah, and that's uh, as the playoff grows. To me, that's one of the uh, the drawbacks of it is the possibility for, as I call them, three matches. You get the rematch in the conference championship, and then you get the three match in the uh, the college football playoff. We could see that, you know, not just in the SEC, we see it in other conferences too. If if this playoff format that's been proposed is approved, and I think we're probably a long way from that, you could get two auto bids for the Big Twelve playing the regular season. They play in, the, in what would be a mostly meaningless conference championship game, if you know you get two auto bids anyway, and then they could meet again in the, in the postseason. So these three matches, um, I think we're going to start seeing some of those in, in, uh, in this expanded playoff era. We know the 12-team playoff is here for at least the next two years, John, and then the, the contract expires, and that's why we have these discussions about possible expansion. But... Uh, you know, as I said, nothing's approved yet. We know how these things work. A few formats get leaked out through the media, and the final, the final version doesn't always match what those early formats looked like. So, uh, let's fast forward. The year is 2026. So we've had two years of the 12-team playoff, and we're now into the next CFP contract. How many teams? do you think are in the playoff in the year 2026? Do you think it'll stay at 12? Do you think it'll be at 14 in 2026? Or do you think it's all the way up to 16 or more by 2026? I think it would probably go to 14, but 16 might not be far behind. It's so for all these years, we, everybody screamed, begged, cajoled, give us a playoff. <laughs> Never got one. Finally got a championship game. Then you got four teams. And now it's like the the tempo has changed dramatically. It's And I think, once again, it's money-driven. I don't know why this couldn't have been figured out long ago. You're going to make more money the more teams you have in a college football playoff. It's, it's not rocket science. So, um, yeah, I think it's inevitable. A 16-team playoff. That's going to take a lot away from a regular season. And how many SEC teams do you think would be in a 16-team playoff? Mm, I mean, Gosh. the auto bids muddy the waters, but if you just had an all-at-large 16-team playoff, I could see as many as eight SEC teams in that field. And, and we often say, like, um, you know, what's good for one particular conference may not be good for the sport, but who's looking out for that? Right. And I, I do think there's a big difference between 12 and 16. I mean, it's just four teams, but I like you think at, at some point you're chipping into the value of the regular season. I, I still think that the regular season maintains a lot of value with 12 teams because you got the four first round buys. You can only get a buy if you're a conference champion. Uh, there's only seven at large bids. I, I still think enough value is retained for the regular season in this current 12 team format. But if you go from 12 to 16, 
you further water down conference championships, you take you take buys off the board, and you know depending on how they divvy up the bids, you could see almost half of a conference of one of these power two conferences in in the playoff. And again, I think that's good for a conference, but may not be good for the sport as a whole. But who's looking out for that? Well, one thing you never hear anymore. Well, all those playoff games would put a real strain on the student athlete. I haven't heard that in a while. That used to be one of the paramount arguments against going to a playoff would put too much wear and tear, too much pressure, too much physical stress on a student athlete. But now these guys are getting paid and that's kind of fallen by the wayside. They're good to go. No one talks about that anymore and no one's sipping Billy's brew at Gainesville. Certainly not Steve Spurrier. Uh, Spring practice underway. We'll be here to take you through it. Nobody's more excited about spring ball than John and uh, we'll get deeper into the competitions. (laughs) Real or not real (laughs) in the weeks to come. Thanks for listening to this installment of SEC Football Unfiltered.